We are students at Cal State University Dominguez Hills studying the Watch Rebellion. One of the projects that came out of this class is the film that you are about to experience. Our group is diverse with varying backgrounds and experience. Several of us were born in South Los Angeles and others from distant places. Some of us experienced the rebellion while others were born much later and know little about what really happened. These visual images should induce thought-provoking questions and ignite interest within the inquisitive as well as the uninformed as to what really happened behind the scenes which truly caused the 1965 Watch Rebellion. What do these historic images say about the social conditions that people of color endured which frenzied them into collective mass destruction? The Marquette Fry incident that ignited the riot was not the actual cause. Nevertheless, it is interesting to know how this event happened. Marquette Fry and his brother were stopped by a white California Highway Patrol officer and Marquette was charged with drunk driving. During the altercation that followed, Marquette was beaten in front of a small but growing and angry crowd. When another officer arriving on the scene began hitting Fry and his mother, the crowd that had gathered began throwing stones and bottles. Marquette, his brother, and mother were arrested However, the crowd did not disperse. There was a young lady in the crowd that the police accosted because they said she was being defiant. Seeing the police manhandle the young lady who appeared to be pregnant fueled the crowd's anger. As murmuring spread throughout the community, the incident grew and festered. This escalated to looting and burning buildings. In response, the police cracked down on the rioters and on the community at large. The city curfew only covered black LA, an area that the media began calling Watts. Although it covered the neighborhoods of Watts, Central, Avalon, Florence, Green Meadow, Exposition, and Willowbrook, that this swatch of 250,000 residents could be effectively cordoned off from the rest of the city is a testament to the degree of segregation in LA. The uprising lasted seven days. Tens of thousands of African Americans as well as thousands of other Angelinos participated. 34 people died and hundreds were injured, many at the hands of police. 14,000 National Guardsmen had been called out and 4,000 black people had been arrested. $45 million worth of property had been damaged. Examining history and examining life in Watts before the rebellion, they offer insight into the riot's foundation. The roots of the event brewed for several decades prior to the occurrence. Discrimination gradually became a powerful spreading force that swept throughout the community. South LA was not always a ghetto, but it was made into one by public policy that concentrated African Americans into a small area symbolized by Watts. Founded in 1906, Watts was the hub of the Red Line the main transportation system in LA. It became one of the most diverse cities in the county, with 14% African Americans and many Mexicans and immigrant families. The concentration of blacks in South LA increased during World War II. Watts was culturally rich, including clubs that were part of the Central Avenue jazz scene. After civil rights leaders challenged President Roosevelt to open defense jobs to blacks, African Americans fleeing the Jim Crow South were among those who came to work in wartime jobs in California. The Second World War also triggered the need for public housing for wartime workers and then returning veterans. Most cities refused to allow public housing to be built in their boundaries, leaving Watts to be home to four massive public housing projects. Over the years, they and the surrounding neighborhoods became overcrowded with those who were not able to move away. 
the real estate lobby and property owners created clauses in home deeds in many cities that restricted homeowners and landlords to renting and selling to Caucasians and Christians only. By 1950, Watts was 90% black. White gangs enforced segregation by terrorizing people when they lingered at the borders or crossed the tracks, and black gangs sprang up in self-defense. Education was one issue that had festered since the 1940s. Segregation reared its ugly head at John C. Fremont High School during this period. Six African-American students attempted to integrate the all-white school. They were racially taunted, including death threats, and had rotten food thrown at them. A mock lynching occurred a few years later. These six students were advised to attend another institution and the offenders were simply told that their actions were not right. Residents suffered years of being accosted by law enforcement agencies, the inadequate school system, the lack of jobs, lack of adequate, decent, affordable housing, and substandard health care or retail outlets. Civil rights organizations managed to see legislators pass the Rumford Housing Act in 1963, which outlawed many racist housing restrictions. But in 1964, white voters shattered the victory with Proposition 14, driving many to wonder how justice would ever prevail. African-American residents of South LA formed organizations and built coalitions with like-minded people to fight against racial bias. But nobody seemed to be listening. The city of Los Angeles, the state of California, and the whole country did not have a clue as to the nature of the issues that were stirring in the Watts culture. Yet the idea that California was different from the South was echoed in statements like Governor Pat Brown's California is a state where there is no racial discrimination. There is a long history of racism in the United States. African Americans in Los Angeles County, in particular the Watts area, were being treated unjustly and they are not going to take it any longer. In their anger, black Americans wanted to voice their unfair treatment by the police and the local government. If the abusers are the people who are supposed to protect you, who can you turn to? For example, in 1962, several unarmed members of the Nation of Islam were either killed or badly beaten, and the police were not held accountable for their actions. Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam minister, petitioned the United Nations about brutal police activity in Los Angeles. In 1963, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., spoke to a huge crowd in Los Angeles and said, you have segregation and discrimination here and police brutality. Outrage was in the air in 1965, and it was inevitable that something needed to be done. African Americans used their actions for their voice to bring attention to the injustice. Continued abuse often triggers collective responses from marginalized people. There is no such thing as an army of one. As a single shot does not constitute a war, a small group with a singularity of purpose can quickly mobilize into a sizable deadly force. They rebelled. I clearly recall at the time the TV commentators accusing the residents of burning down their own homes. The truth is that barely any homes were burned. Businesses were targeted and were the ones primarily owned by those who were not African American who charged highly inflated prices for goods or services. In the aftermath, the McCone Commission's final analysis on the causes of the Watts Rebellion lacked a true understanding of what was really going on. Bayard Rustin, when reflecting upon his thoughts on the Commission's report, lamented, It lacks a political will to demand that the vast resources of contemporary America be used to build a genuinely great society that will finally put 
an end to these deprivations. The report lacked a true highway to fixing the problem, which ultimately led to the 1992 uprising in Los Angeles. The national media spotlight brings enhancement and development to the city of Watts and surrounding communities. Dreams were placed on the blueprint and construction that represented cultural awakening, civic awareness, educational institutions, employment training, and healthcare, among other promised benefits. While the promise did not live up to the hope, some steps were made toward positive change. One important change to come about was Martin Luther King Jr. Hospital. For the first time, a county hospital that accepted all people was established in the South Los Angeles area. California State University, Dominguez Hills, Los Angeles Southwest College, additional K-12 schools, and additional employment and vocational training facilities were brought to the area in order to increase educational access in underserved areas. People gained hope for their futures in 1966 when the California Supreme Court overturned Prop 14. This hateful proposition had sought to continue segregation in housing after the Rumford Act was passed to open fair housing to all. Though more funding was needed after the rebellion, money for art projects such as the Writers' Workshop, changes to FHA lending regulations to encourage home buying, and funds channeled through the Watts Labor Community Action Center founded by Ted Watkins allowed for cleanup, renovation of local housing for rent, and the Watts Credit Union. Watts Stats came in 1972 as a way for Stats Ruckers, in their words, to create, motivate, and instill a sense of pride in the citizens of the Watts community. Watts was originally planned as a small concert to raise money for the Watts Summer Festival turned into one of the largest festivals of the decade, with 112,000 attendees. The Black Power ideology developed in 1966 as an outgrowth of the rebellions that raged across the nation during the 60s. The Watts Uprising was a turning point, and in the next decade, people celebrated and embraced cultural pride. The celebration of pride inspired the women's, Chicano, lesbian and gay, and the Native American movements. While African American political power had been increasing through city council seats won by a few black and Hispanic candidates in 1973, the demand for change eventually won a black police sergeant by the name of Tom Bradley a position as the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. All of these outcomes were positive attempts to change the South Los Angeles reality Perhaps the most secret outcome was that Los Angeles could no longer deny its severely segregated schools, housing, property tax codes, and social structures which were in fact deeply racist, deeply racist, deeply racist, and the city itself was not the shining light and bastion of equality that it projected for the world to see. Unemployment, inadequate schools, and dilapidated housing are the real problems of Watts. These injustices filled the African American community with anger and frustration that led the community to express their discontent of the horrific conditions. The meaning of the 1965 Watts Rebellion is the importance to fight racism, economic inequalities, and police abuse. The Watts Rebellion revealed to the nation that change is possible among minorities if we stand with solidarity against prejudiced situations. If we want social change, we need to get organized. That means understanding our history. In 1960, Governor Brown approved legislation to establish a new college in Los Angeles County. In July 1965, Dominguez was chosen as one of uh, four possible new locations. It was not until after the August 1965 Watts Rebellion that the governor pushed to have Dominguez as the location. He wanted the campus to be with the people. The commemoration is important to California State Dominguez Hills because as students, we need to know that the school was built here to serve the surrounding communities.
The questions we must ask ourselves include, what issues of social significance have transpired since the Watts Rebellion? Are the embers of the Watts Rebellion still smoldering today? Fifty years later, we are ripe for another rebellion. What seemed to have happened 50 years ago are similar situations that are happening today, but in a different time. Today, the same conditions remain amongst minorities. Police brutality cases are being exposed all over the nation. We witnessed such cases like Michael Brown in Ferguson and Walter Scott in North Charleston. Social media has become a powerful tool in spreading consciousness. We see a trend in which blacks and browns keep struggling for dignity.